It's time for Windows Weekly episode 153 today. Paul talks about the iPhone leak. We look at the new Dell Lightning and a review of Office 2010. It's here, it's here. Windows Weekly is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 153 for April 23rd, 2010. You're made of corn. Windows Weekly is brought to you by GoToTraining. Improve learning, participation, and access to training programs, plus save a bunch with GoToTraining. For a free trial, visit GoToTraining.com. And by Drobo, the original, S, Pro, and the new Drobo Elite, offering expandable storage products for individuals, small businesses, and creative teams. For more information and rebates up to $500, visit drobo.com slash windows. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, episode 153, and here he is, the man of the hour, the king at the super site for Windows, winsupersite.com, editor... Uh, for the news portion of Windows IT Pro and the author of Windows 7 Secrets and the soon-to-appear Windows Phone Secrets, Mr. Paul Farratt. Yellow. You look like you're uh, uh, in the Kingston Trio. Are you going to sing, <laughs> Oh, yeah. they'll never return. Yes, he'll never return. You, it's a stripey <laughs> shirt. I like it. Yeah. No, no, I'm not going to sing that. Sorry. <laughs> but it's about Boston. The, if the song is, yeah, not the, the shirt. Is, not the shirt. What is the shirt about? <laughs> Sure, it is about. I had to go to a meeting today, so I had to actually put on pants and. Oh, wear, not wear only clothes, shirts, like we a, are blessed. We yeah. are blessed. I know. I can be human occasionally. Shirt and pants. You look beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank You're you, sir. Just fabulous. Thank you. So this has been a uh, a very busy week, and I guess we start uh, with, um, or do we, with the Microsoft no, we earnings? Don't. No? Well, so they're going to announce the earnings today. Uh, it may happen while we're still talking, depending on how long we go. It's Will we to be break about... in? We'll have a breaking news. De -de 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 this just yeah, in. Why not? Why I can not? monitor it. It's supposed to be, though, not till 1 o'clock, right? My time. It's two hours yeah. from now. So we might not actually get to it, but I just thought I'd throw it in there just what in is, case. What is the analyst's ex expectation? A good, a well, good quarter, it's right? It's good as, you know, good. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. good. Windows 7 is doing great. Um, it's, I, you know, Microsoft's earnings don't really change that much because, you know, their core products, Office, Windows Server, do great. And everything else they make apparently goes into a dumpster somewhere. It's unclear what the point of it is. And that's pretty much how it breaks down almost every single quarter. So, you know, 14 billion bucks uh, in revenues and so forth. Um, I think the big, well, the big thing will be just watching, um, you know, how Windows 7 does, if there's any news there along uh, the lines of, you know, numbers, which are always interesting as far as units sold. And I think for Office, because it's the quarter before Office 2010 ships, um, you know, does that have a shortfall now? Or does it, you know, does it, does it drop off a cliff because there's a new version coming? I guess we'll find out. Apparently there are tablet computers that are a big deal for some reason. Uh, so this is unlike, um, see, Apple, for instance, in their results this week, surprised the analysts. Because uh, Apple plays, did you see my, well, but did they? play did a game. They, did they know? <laughs> they play <laughs> a game. They, 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 actually what happened, you know, uh, there was a great blog post about this. You know, there are two kinds of analysts, right? There are the analysts that get fed figures right. by Apple. And thus, these analysts come out and say, this is what we expect from Apple. And then Apple, of course, blows by that. And they're like, wow, they really shattered our expectations. <laughs> you know, the headlines are all, Apple shatters expectations again. But, um, you know, the guy who wrote this post um, wrote it before Apple's earnings, and, and his numbers were almost identical to, to what Apple's Apple actual numbers. Huh. Yeah, the actual units sold for all of the products, the money, he was dead on, you know. And he's like, you know, Apple doesn't actually shatter expectations. They just they do exactly what you think they're going to do, which, by the way, is hugely positive. Um, and a lot of people misconstrued that uh, with my own, you know, with my stuff when I wrote about Apple this week. But, you know, with Microsoft, it's a different thing because Microsoft is 
a more conservative company. Uh, obviously, a, lot, a big part of their business is is business, and um, they're into predictability. You right. know, right? And when it, when Microsoft says we expect to sell this or to have, they you know, know pretty well. Uh, they ex that's that is what they expect. They're not playing any games, so right. it's a different thing. So yes, I think the <laughs> the expectations for Microsoft are probably going to be closer to reality. Um, you know, the thing for Microsoft is, uh, unfortunately for them, it's it's perceived as a mature business. You know, Apple uh, benefits from some kind of a weird uh, Steve Jobs bump thing where it's like, you know, they're, they're operating as if they are a new company of some sort, when in fact Apple has been around, if anything, uh, I don't know, longer than Microsoft, but about as long as Microsoft. Um, but they, they're involved primarily in consumer products, which is a, a hipper, younger kind of a thing. And their uh, their customers tend to be hipper and younger, and they're you know they they get that kind of a bump that's really interesting. I mean, Microsoft is just a huge corporation that's everywhere, so you know they're not going to have some crazy blockbuster quarter where all of a sudden their share you know <laughs> jumps two hundred percent or so. it's just it's not going to happen. I mean, it's just a mature company, right? And I Apple, love and, and God, by, I love this company, and, and I love covering them. And Apple is immature. <laughs> and Apple is immature. Well, they are in some ways. I mean, but. Uh, and and by the way, by design, and that's fine. I mean, that's part of their whole uh, their whole vibe. We just got a massive thunderclap outside. Oh, I didn't hear it. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. It Let's was see. so beautiful out today. I briefly toyed with the notion of, you know, setting up stuff outside. It's good you didn't. <laughs> I know. It's good you didn't. We would be running inside right now. Yes, sir. So we'll watch, and uh, I suspect when we come back next week, the uh, numbers mm -hmm. will be very, you know, predictable. It has been, though, a remarkable quarter for the tech industry, right? I mean, PC yeah. sales were through the roof. Across the board, Intel had uh, big numbers. Even Yahoo had a huge rebound. Uh, and Yahoo, a company That's a who... shock. Yeah, well, many people, and, and myself included, have written off Yahoo entirely. And one quarter does not a company make, of course. But, um, yeah, you know, so... That's nice, and that's a good sign for the economy in general. I, probably a better sign just for the tech industry part of the economy. But, um, yeah, good news all around, so that's good stuff. Um, we have other big news. You have it we in do. your hands. You have the trading cards. It must be <laughs> real, and I'm going to tell everybody about that. You were going to tell everybody about that in just a second before we do that. Okay. I would like to mention go to training. This is so new, I don't even have a lower third for the video yet. This is so new. This is you're the first to hear about this. This is so new. We don't even have a special magical URL for it. This is new. What for is it, Leo? What is it? You're probably wondering what is it. It is. <laughs> I am wondering what the hell are you talking about, Leo? This is brand new from Citrix. You know they. You know Citrix Remote Access, of course, is all over enterprise. We talk about go to meeting, go to my PC. Uh, go to assist go to training is the newest from go to meeting it is designed for training obviously uh, it's a web-based tool which enables as many as 200 people to connect to a training session right from their desktops either live in real time so you have the interactivity and there's a lot of interactivity there's chat of course but there's polling there's testing as you need for training and the trainer can record the session and then make it on demand forever it's made for companies or consultants who need to train employees or customers all over you know, the world, wherever they happen to be. It's a great way to bring your training sessions online easily and affordably. <laughs> Paul just run out of the room <laughs> in horror, in mock I'm back, horror. baby. <laughs> I hit the door <laughs> slam. I thought, where'd he go? Uh, it has the same features uh, as GoToMeeting, uh, for instance, sharing of the screens. You can pass control from one presenter to another, voice over IP, chat, session recording. But they've also got special features for training. Uh, you first create a customized training session, which includes the training schedule, the description, and a registration form. That's new. Because if you want it, you don't have to, but if you want it, so your attendees can register. You can upload, I love this, a content library, so documents of any kind or link to any website so that you have a training curriculum that they can review ahead of time if they want or they can review after the fact. You can create and customize training tests to give the attendees before, attendees before during, or after each session. You can also send out email invites. I mean, this is, this is uh, just what your trainer has been looking for. Now, I know some of your trainers, all you have to do is go to gototraining.com and you get a 30-day free trial right now. But if you're not a trainer, maybe you've been sitting through some bad corporate training... <laughs> lately you'd like them to maybe improve 
you can send a quick note to the trainer and tell them about go to training and if you're an IT manager bring it up at your next staff meeting so people can learn more about it go to training.com make your training program more effective try it free right now for free 30 days go to training.com so you have now do you have the retail packaging of this or is this uh no, I got the final code in electronic form uh, from Microsoft. If, actually, if you're on MSDN or TechNet, as of today, it, the product is available. Yay. And I think MSDN has Professional Plus, and TechNet might have Professional and Professional Plus. I'm not sure what's over there. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it RTM'd last week, I think, about a week ago. Cool. And the code is out now. The uh, business customers will be getting it over the next month, and then they'll do the consumer launch in June. For the, no, that, that are will be they the doing this uh, run, run, what is it called? Run once, run, run click away? One, uh, click, click, click to run. To run I think. Are yeah, they doing yeah. that? Yeah, so that will be part of the retail uh, availability, right? So you'll be able to buy it in a box with a disc if you want, but you can also buy that, uh, the, you know, the card uh, that has the product key and you actually download it online and oh, uh, do it. Yeah, so all kinds of different options this time around. I, I think, you know, Office, it's funny. Office is such a successful product. It's obviously the number two product at Microsoft behind Windows. You know, like Microsoft itself, it's kind of a conservative thing. You know, they're moving to the web with this version, but conservatively. You know, they're moving to electronic distribution, but, you know, conservatively. But it, it, it really has not been held back uh, by being conservative. I think people expect Office to be somewhat conservative, and uh, it just hasn't been disappointing ever. I mean, I don't think there's been a bad version of Office, uh, maybe ever. And uh, certainly not in, you know, since 1995. And, um, you know, it's just kind of chugged right along. And, and you know, they add features uh, that are valuable every time around. I mean, one of the big things I went into this meeting today I had with Microsoft wanted to ask about was, you know, from a really broad perspective, when you look at Office 2010, you know, just the, the basic apps, Word, Excel, and so forth, and you compare it to Office 2007, I mean, it, you know, they both have the ribbon. You know, is is there really that big of a deal? Isn't that always the question? Is do I need to upgrade? Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, as I look to review this product, you know, one of the things I'm looking at is, I mean, how do you? What's the sell point here? You know, I mean, why? You know, why would someone who has Office 2007 want to do this? And I, I really, honestly expected from Microsoft's perspective that. The big upgrade story would, in fact, be Office 2003, right? That, you know, the differences when you move up from 2003 to, two, you know, to 2010 are dramatic. But the differences when you move from 2007 to 2010, I thought, perhaps would be less dramatic. And, of course, it is less dramatic. But, actually, there are some, some good reasons to, to upgrade, regardless of which version you have. And, as it turns out, their, <clears throat> their own marketing and their own explanations for why they feel that people should upgrade are actually based on 2007 users, not on 2003. Wait a, uh, minute, wait a minute, why is that? Well, because they always compare themselves to the previous the, version. The recent one. Even though, yeah. well, what would you guess? Are the majority of users 2003? Yeah. Well, I don't have to guess. I asked and they told me. <laughs> so, yeah, as it, as it turns out, 70-plus um, uh, percent Whoa! Of, of Office deployments. So, there's are, the, so that's what I'm world. saying. The question is always, sh should I upgrade? And apparently last time they, didn't, they said no. But again, you know, in the conservative world of Microsoft Office, this is sort of the way it's always gone. You know, it's in every other version right. kind of thing. Um, and, you know, that's interesting to me. So, yeah, about 70% for 2003, about 25 to 30% for 2007. And then just a sliver um, of the holdouts, you know, <laughs> who are using what, you know, God knows what they're using. But uh, older, <laughs> version, older Office versions. Office 95. Like, <laughs> yeah, you never know. You, you never, never know. know. In fact... Um, I was joking around with them today about uh, a goof post I had made about uh, that Google Docs upgrade, and I had posted a screenshot of Word for for DOS, and and identified it as Google Docs. You know, <laughs> it's a joke because it was that, um, you know, Primitive, it's that bad right. in my my opinion. And and the the truth is, and this is really you know, it's really funny because I'm I'm in the middle of cleaning my office, which is why it's such a disaster. You can only see a little bit of it behind you, but it it, it is it literally. It's like I'll a post-apocalyptic disaster in here. <laughs> and like uh, one of the things I came across was all of my old beta documentation. I mean, I'm talking tons of, well, stacks and stacks, I mean, feet of paper. I mean, you know, six feet tall probably of paper. And then all my old beta CDs and disks and all this stuff. And one of the things I came across was Office 95, uh, one of the beta versions. And I thought, you know, 
it would be funny to take a picture of this and, and say this is Google Docs. But when I looked at it, what I realized is Office 95 is beautiful compared to Google Docs. I mean, Google Docs is not even close to Office 95. So that's the reason I went and grabbed the, uh, uh, the word for DOS screenshot because... As it turns out, this 15-year-old version of Office was is already better than today's Google Docs. Well, so but better is I mean, I use Google Docs. Yeah, and it, it's a subject. I mean, it depends on what you're using it for. Better. Well, no, I mean, there's one thing More that powerful it just be, certainly because it is an internet product and because it's a modern, you know, a day uh, web service. Yes, there you have collaboration features that yeah. were not available on Office 95. But I mean, right. um, if you're just if your interest is, I need to generate words, for example, or um, you know, generate numbers or, you know, go churn through numbers in a spreadsheet. Actually, uh, Office 95 is more powerful than Google Certainly Docs. on a spreadsheet. Yeah, it's painful yeah. to use a Google spreadsheet. Yeah. Unless you have very simple needs. Right. But I, for writing, I find I don't need anything but a plain text dump feature. Yeah, well, sure. And that's the thing. And, and in fact, I was just thinking about that today, again, in the context of this. I've been writing about writing on my uh, Windows phone uh, secrets blog. And one of the things that occurred to me today as I was driving back from this meeting is, uh, you know, the notion of tools, you know, and what are the tools you use to get your job done and, and how much of that, those tools you actually use and so forth. Word is indispensable. And, and one of the things that I have, to me, that is, um, one of the things I've looked at every single time there's been an upgrade to Office is whether or not I really need to use this new version of Word. You know, Word being the primary Office application that I use, you know, would I lose anything uh, by not moving to the new version. And every time there's been something, you know, I'd have to say this is the first time that there almost isn't anything. But then again, I was uh, in, in this discussion I had with them today, they pointed out something to me that I hadn't actually been that aware of. And now I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> actually, there's and it's usually something it. minor. It is minor. And, and um, again, uh, as a writer, a professional writer who uses word every day, I know that I only use a tiny percentage. Do you use it because your publisher needs it and you need features for your publisher? Because, I mean, you could, yeah. I mean, as a writer, you could, many writers, you could use Notepad, right? I mean. Well, I guess so. I mean, I, I unfortunately, and from a crutch type perspective, I have come to expect and rely on certain autocorrect features in Word. Uh, By yes. the way, to my detriment, uh, absolutely, as a writer and. Um, no, but I know what you mean. And, and, and to my, uh, to my good humor some days, I mean. There are certain sentences you can construct in Word where it will correct one of those it's apostrophe S versus it's no apostrophe S. And it will say this is wrong and you correct it and it says this is wrong and it tells you to put back the way it was and it's just a never ending circle. I mean, it still does do those things. <laughs> I hate grammar checkers. I really okay. do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, it, uh, in some ways I think it might make you weaker as a writer. But then again, I mean, the benefits of these features are such that it's hard to live without them. Right. So. I, I, I suppose, uh, yeah, you could make a case for using something simpler. But then again, you know, one of the things I'm really eager to try with this version is the Word web app, right? The um, kind of stripped down version of web that lives up in the cloud. And within the next couple of weeks or so, uh, that will become available to the public. And when I look at that and you look at how they strip it down compared to the full blown Word 2010. And I think, you know, I mean, for most of what I do every day, that would make a lot of sense for me. And not just because it's stripped down and, and smaller and all that, but because when you're moving information from uh, what is essentially a website and then you're publishing to the web, there are actually, some, or, or I will see, I'm interested to see, there may be some benefits to doing that. Because one of the screwy things about Word, for all of its power, is that when you want to import Word documents into a a web form of some kind, you know, if you're publishing to a website or whatever it is, you know, they have to have these special importers that strip away a lot of the garbage that's in these Word docs. And the success rate of that, in my experience, has been kind of mixed. So I'm curious if I go from a web-based version of Word to these web forms that I need to use for work, if that is actually a better way to do it. And if it is, that's something I'll use at least for my web-oriented writing. I mean, yes, for the books, you have to, you know, you have to use Word. We should, I'm, I could go on and on because I'm very curious about the yep. process of writing, but we should probably talk about, I'm sure people yeah. are going, okay, so what's in 2010? What's new? In fact, they gave you play, little baseball cards, right, with all the new features? They did, and I can't, I can't read them because they're so small. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Uh, well, they're one of those 23-year-old design products. I mean, I, I, there's no way. I, I'll, let me see if I can get one close enough. Do you have a mag My wife gave me a magnifying glass for our anniversary. Well, look Tuesday. how small. Let's you need that. that. Oh, it's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, no, I can see them. And there's a tiny. Yeah. 
So there are a lot of features. Um, they had a they had a squeeze. It they kind of padded thing. the list. I noticed that sixty four bit version is one of the items on every single one of these. But <laughs> you know, looking at uh, Office maybe more broadly than that, right? Um, they they highlighted what what they feel what Microsoft feels to be the five biggest features, right, uh, in Office twenty ten. And these these are legitimately big deals. I mean, uh, depending on your needs, again. Well, so this is, like, again, this is the question everybody asks when a new office comes out. What's in it that I would need? Right. And so uh, that long-winded explanation I just gave is how I look at it because I look at Office from the perspective of a Word user primarily. Right. And I look at Word. And, you know, Word is a mature product. It has been for a long time. I mean, let's face it. You know, the, the grammar and spell checking can get a little better <laughs> every time. You know, but uh, at the end of the day, I am typing away and words are, you know, being generated. It's in the, the gold standard. Every, I mean, we can acknowledge that. Oh, I, right. But what I was saying was, you know, as you move from version to version, I mean, we're talking about minor right. things, I mean, for the most part. It's mature. Part, it's mature. It's as just the way said. it is. Yeah. Yeah. But so, you know, I'm going to, I guess, you know, this is stuff that I'm looking at for my own review. So I don't want to blow away my review entirely. But I, just so you know, the way I go about and do things is, you know, Microsoft provides you with information. You know, there's a reviewer's guide. There's these lists of new features you know, the things they'd like you to, to um, cover and so forth. But I mean, as someone who's been using the, the Word 2010 beta for the past several months, you know, I notice things in here that are different. I have questions, you know, I ask them questions about things. So um, it's positive and negative, I guess, in some ways. Uh, you know, so for example, one of the features that they are touting, which is actually all positive if you're a PowerPoint user, is something called PowerPoint Broadcast. And that's a way to use a free web service that Microsoft provides where people who want to access your PowerPoint presentation when you're, while you're giving it, allowing you to do things like remote broadcasting of PowerPoint oh, right over the neat. web. Wow. You, it, uh, you, uh, you give them a URL, and they can follow along as you talk. Ooh, and one Citrix of the most effective... Not like this. <laughs> yeah. It's really nice. And, and they did a very effective demo uh, months and months ago, back in, I don't know, September or October, when they had their reviewers workshop for, the I think, the beta version. You know, one of the presenters used this to broadcast his PowerPoint rather than put it up on the screen. Although I think it was up there as well. He had us all click on this URL, and we we all followed along on our own laptops. And that's that's really neat, and it's it's very effective, and that works really well. Um, I've been sort of down on Outlook uh, as a program. I feel that it's uh, do you get by the way if you do that PowerPoint, you get all the features, or is it a stripped down feature set? On the no, web? it's everything. It's really it's. it's it's perfect fidelity. Oh, it's that's beautiful. so cool. Well, it's over Silverlight, right? Uh -huh. So you need a Silverlight capable browser. And that means you have is, the Windows Presentation Foundation, so anything you could do on Windows, you can do. Well, something very similar to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's um, a very high WPF? quality. I thought it was. They're, they're comparable is the way oh, I would okay. put it. it okay. uh, the way to think of it is uh, Silverlight, the presentation stuff in Silverlight is very comparable to, oh, I'm sorry, could be described as a web version of WPF. Got it. Got it. That might I got be it. Yeah. That's think good. Of that. Good. Now I got it. Now I'm. Yeah. I'm understanding. I'm grokking you. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, major, if you are an Outlook user, you have to get Office 2010, or at least Outlook 2010. It is a major, major advance. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there. It's actually, you know, again, not necessarily personally a huge fan of Outlook, but there's so either. much, hmm. so much. No, but there's so much stuff there. Yeah, as uh, somebody, just as you live in, you live in, uh, in Word. I live in email. Yeah, and I think that those are the kind of the, the big two. And I mean, there's my there's Lisa who lives in Excel, but but those are and Outlook is the one that really has been the laggard, if you ask me. Yes, it and really and needed actually. Help. The reason for that, I think, is that Outlook is a lot about the the Chrome, you know, the stuff around the content. Right. Uh, I the one of the reasons I like Gmail and still use Gmail is that it's lightweight and and the interface is minimal, and I. I deal with the email and I go and I go and I, it's very it's very efficient. Mm -hmm. um, Outlook I find to be a little much, you know. But again, uh, in the process of reviewing it, I've actually been running Outlook here, and I, and I have to say, you know, for the people who do use this stuff, and and by the way, for a huge percentage of email users, Outlook is email, oh, right? Yeah, it is their day. It's it's the oh, yeah. thing they have up and running. It's their schedule. It's their contacts. It's yep. all their stuff. You know, there are there's sort of a silliness with Outlook. It's very ponderous. Uh, to move Outlook data from one PC to another. There's no good synchronization me uh, mechanism there at all. Um, sometimes information gets locked in Outlook. It's not actually attached to something that's up in the cloud. I, I, there's, there's another conversation to be had there. But but if you are an Outlook user, um, this version is humongous. Uh, lots and lots of, uh, both, <laughs> both in disk size. No, it's, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So that that's a big deal. 
Um, one of the things that they're touting with this version is that they've they put the ribbon UI everywhere. You know, in, in Office 20, uh, 2007, it was only in some of the applications. Um, that's okay, you know, <laughs> semi-obvious. But actually, one of the really cool things about the ribbon in Office 2010, and this is something I had, I had really not paid a lot of attention to uh, previous, and so now I'm going to be looking at this, is the ability to fully customize the ribbon. You know, one of the big complaints they got from people was, you know, you have all these tabs. And this is something that I actually run into. So, for example, I often... I can, I would say 99% of the time, I can leave that thing on the home tab and never access any other tab. But every once in a while, I'll have to go to, say, the review tab to do track changes. You know, wouldn't it be nice if I could just put a couple of the track changes things I need on the home tab and never have to make that switch? Because it's, you know, right. it's, not, it's not very convenient. Well, in Office 2010, you can. You know, um, that's humongous. You can remove stuff from the ribbon that you don't like. You can add stuff to the ribbon. You can move stuff around. So if you want to put some of those reviewing elements... On the home tab, go nuts. Uh, you can make your own tabs, you know, Paul's special tab. Whatever. Oh, that's put all great. Yeah, that's actually a big, big deal. And I think for Office Power users, uh, I think that's going to be a big deal. Um, there's a new backstage view, um, which comes up when you click that file tab, sort of a, a replacement for the file menu. There's no menu uh, now in Office 2010. This is kind of hit or miss. It's, it's, it's a really good idea because by default, it takes up the whole application window. But there are certain things that you click on, like the options... Uh, save as or open or whatever that actually open these sub windows instead of open you know instead of keeping it in the uh, in the backstage view I was told today for, uh, when I asked about that because uh, to me that's sort of a, a problem they said actually our intention was to have gotten everything into this backstage view but we, we ran out of time so uh, so in some ways the, the backstage view in office 2010 is to office 2010 what the ribbon was in office 2007 a really good idea but not quite all the way there. And presumably in the next version, you know, they'll fix that. Um, so they'll get there, you know, and that, that's, uh, but still an improvement over what was available for. And then there's other stuff, you know, they talk about um, the ability to do, you know, rich content inside of Office, which sounds a little bit silly. And by that, I mean things like uh, photo and video content and all that stuff. But if you've ever put video into a presentation, for example, or photos, or photos into a, a Word document or whatever it is, you know, in the past, you always had to deal with these third-party applications to do all the editing. So you'd be in and out, in and out, back and forth. And now you can actually do all of that stuff right inside of these Office applications. And the capabilities there are actually kind of incredible. Now, when I create, uh, let's say, Word documents, I'm not editing photos in Word. And that sounds kind of silly when you think about it. But some of the capabilities there are actually really exciting. For example, let's say you wanted to do something like make a photo slideshow. I mean, you probably have gotten these emails where people send out um, like PowerPoint presentations with photos in them. And you can actually run them as a standalone app kind of. And, and that's cute, but you need a PowerPoint viewer or you need like a standalone thing that has the viewer built in with your little photo slideshow and everything. Um, you can actually use PowerPoint right now to pull in all of your photos or whatever selection of photos. You know, make up a, a slide at the beginning that has, um, you know, whatever kind of uh, front piece you want on there. You know, add music or narration, whatever, and then write it out to a WMV file as a movie file and then put it up on YouTube and share it with the world that way. I mean, they've turned PowerPoint into something that can actually be used to present like your home photo collection from a trip or something. It actually works really, really well for that. And I think, again, from an efficiency standpoint, if you, if you need to use any of this content in your documents, it's a nice way to do it in the doc, you know, in the application you're already using and not have to worry about okay, now I need to load this other thing, you know, to get stuff done. So so that's some of the big stuff I'd say in the suite. So I, I guess I'd hold off uh, beyond that. I, I'll, you know, I'll be reviewing it. So There's a lot more. I'm sure there's thousands. There's of a, features, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, those are some of the high points. Obviously, there's an Office uh, web app uh, suite coming. There's integration with Windows Live um, and Hotmail and all that stuff. And, there's, you know, there's a lot of other stuff going on there. But it's a... Um, if you, ha if you had... Big, a couple of questions from the chat room. One, if yeah. you'd ha held off on upgrading to Office 2007, and yeah. you are one of those 70% of the people who are still using 2003, this would be a worthwhile upgrade, and you would recommend it as opposed to going to 2007. Yeah, from 2003, to me, this is a no-brainer. Big big upgrade. It's huge. Yeah. It's like XP to Windows 7. Yeah, and actually, it's really interesting because in the case of Windows, when you look at Windows 7, Microsoft acts in many ways. And by the way, in my own book, you know, in the Windows 7 Secrets book, you know, you, you presume that the audience is mostly XP-based, and that's who you're trying to hit because you really want to get those guys off that old version. It's interesting to me that with Office, 
Um, I, they honestly feel like, look, if they're on 2003, they're going to 2010. It's, it's a huge upgrade. We don't even have to sell it to them. Um, but we do have to sell it to Office 2007 users because that thing is already, you know, pretty mature, uh, pretty nice. You know, how, how do we sell it to those people? Um, interesting uh, difference in perspective. Uh, but yeah, I think from Office 2003, it's, a, it's such a major upgrade. You have to do it. And then uh, secondarily, um, do you... Well, when's it? What's how? How do I get it? <laughs> if I <laughs> if think? I have the beta, if I've been using yep. the beta, which I have, this yeah. is a significant upgrade from the beta. Even it I wouldn't like. say it's a significant upgrade oh, okay, uh, from not. the beta. Okay, no. But so you the know, beta has some time before it runs out. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm trying to. It say. It does, yeah. And they have changed some things since the beta. But I would say, based on the list I saw, um, nothing dramatic from the beta. So no or, urgency to upgrade if you're using the beta and you want to save some money for a few more months. Yeah, no, I would, yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, you know, again, conservative product, right? I mean, uh, the the beta they shipped was largely that's great. What they wanted to ship, yeah, I loved it. Yep. Uh, I don't know using it. I, going back and forth, I don't know. Okay. It. Okay. And then when can I uh, when can I buy it? I know it's on TechNet and MSDN, mm -hmm. but uh, what, when's it in the stores? So it depends on who you are, right? Uh, TechNet, like you said, uh, TechNet and MSDN have it now. Um, Sometime in the next week, volume license customers will get it from uh, Software Assurance. Uh, the business launch is going to be on May 12th, and it will be in New York, and I believe I've signed up for it. I think I'm going to be going to that. Oh, good. Uh, and then sometime in June, Microsoft will uh, deliver the retail versions uh, to stores. Also, those cards, the click-to-run stuff, and you'll see it on new PCs and so forth. They haven't set a date. My, uh, the last I heard was June 15th, although that was some time ago, but definitely sometime in June. And that's sort of the you know the sliding <laughs> release schedule there for, for the product. But uh, and then I also remember if you want to, uh, if you were to purchase Office two thousand seven, I think between now and sometime in October, uh, you qualify for a free version of Office twenty ten as well. So if you can get Office you know two thousand seven okay. che cheaply enough, I mean that might be something to consider. Pricing. It is exactly the same as. Uh, the previous version, if I recall correctly, uh, the versions aren't exactly the same. You know, they've gotten rid of uh, some of the SKUs, like Ult Ultimate Edition is gone. Um, but I believe that it is identical to the previous version. Which was pricey. Well, it depends. Well, um, student, you, this Home and Student Edition. Yeah, Home and Student Edition. You don't get about Outlook. Bucks, uh, and you don't get Outlook, that's right. Yeah. And I think the rationale there is that for a lot of students, they're accessing... Uh, email through a web service like Gmail or Hotmail through their school, right? Because uh, both Microsoft and, and Google are very big at providing these services to, to educational institutions for free. So you get a branded version of, you know, whichever service your school has picked. So it just wasn't a huge need uh, right. for those. Right. Well, it's exciting. Always exciting when a new new big package like this comes out. And always fun to yeah, try. Yeah, it's like a freight train coming down the tracks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it just is suddenly here, you know. I feel so unprepared. I went into this, uh, you know, I knew about this meeting for some time. And then, you know, I get in there and they said, you know, everything we tell you today, you can talk about it whenever you want. And I'm like, I haven't written anything. What, <laughs> what are you doing? Are you, I'm supposed to have two weeks or something. What are, you know? Now, you know what I thought was a big story? We talked about it a little bit after uh, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, keynote yesterday at the F8 yep. conference is this facebook thing which i thought was yeah. very interesting it's almost as if microsoft's saying okay uh, you got google docs we got facebook sure. docs yeah that one came out of the blue and obviously i think the timing of it is because this is when facebook had their first ever you know platform developer conference conference but um i think the simplest way to look at this thing which by the way what a great url right docs.com i mean that's easier. beautiful yeah, yeah. uh docs.com or docs as they're calling it is basically Office Web Applications um, for Facebook. And so the value add there is, uh, well, you have a sort of a Facebook-branded uh, site, but what you're integrating with is your Facebook friends list, right? So one of the primary advantages of Google Docs or Outlook Web, I'm sorry, Office Web Apps, is that you can collaborate with other people. So in the case of Microsoft Solution, uh, Word, PowerPoint, and OneNote, all allow some uh, type of interactivity along those lines where people can be editing a, a document uh, concurrently. And that's fine. I mean, taken, uh, you know, in sort of a, 
a general sense, I mean, that's fine. So the, if you were if you were going to do this yourself, you create a Word doc, you put it up in Office web applications, you could send out an email to people and you could say, hey, here's the uh, Office doc we're going to work on together. You know, for those people to view that document, nothing is required. They can click on the URL, they have the authentication they need, they get in, they can view the document. But if they actually want to collaborate with you, they have to have or sign up for a Windows Live ID. Now, that's not necessarily a problem. I mean, if you know these people well enough that you're going to be collaborating on a document, I mean, it seems like you would be all on the same page. But when you look at the world at large, especially for younger people, you know, Facebook is one of those places where people already have huge lists of friends. And it seems like, you know, some of the people they may want to collaborate with are going to be on Facebook with them. So what this does is it remo it, it it allows that authentication piece or that, you know, the, the sharing bit to go through Facebook. So if, if Facebook is where your friends are, that's a, a great way to do it. And it's interesting because this further suggests that we may see other uh, like branded versions of Office Web Apps in the future, right? Uh, why, you know, maybe Yahoo has a version of this, right? Yahoo could get into this business immediately. And by the way, they need to because they got rid of their <laughs> Zimbra product, right? Yeah. Um, by simply branding Office Web Applications and having Yahoo Web Apps or whatever they want to call it. Um, I, that's an interesting business that I don't think anyone really thought about, right, until this happened. And uh, it was a little bit confusing when the stocks for Facebook thing was announced. But, you know, maybe in retrospect, it's really not that, it shouldn't have been that surprising, right? I mean, this is actually a pretty neat thing to do. Is this, how is this related to Office for the Web? This is it. I mean, this is Facebook. It, it is that product. In Facebook. It, uh, linked, linked to your Facebook friends. Yeah. So in other words, um, the way it works, pub, well, there are three, there, so now there are three versions, right? So there's the corporate version that uh, companies can roll out uh, off of SharePoint. And the point behind that is it allows these corporations to control who can share what and with whom, right? Which is what companies would like. You don't want your employees to share a, an internal document with someone out over Windows Live. So they can lock that stuff down. That makes sense. There's a Microsoft public version coming out over Windows Live in the coming weeks um, that, again, will be based on your Windows Live ID. So anyone can view a document on this service, but if you want to edit it with someone or collaborate, you need to have a Windows Live ID. So the Facebook version, which is the third version, and oddly enough, the first to ship, is the one that it works just like the Windows Live version, except that sharing mechanism goes through Facebook, through that friends list, not through Windows Live. So in this case, if, that's, if you live on Facebook, for example, if you're on Facebook every day and that's where all your contacts are, uh, this is uh, probably the version you're going to want to use, not the Windows Live version. It's not, that's not really a businessy thing, is it? I mean, do businesses, I think businesses would be very nervous about that. No, but businesses, if they want to, can host this thing internally. Ah. Not the, not the Facebook version, the Microsoft version. Microsoft, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, no, th that's not what this is for. And, and by the way, for whatever it's worth, I have a hard time, I mean, I've written books with other people, but I have a hard time imagining ever having a Word doc open up on the web and we write in it together at the same time. I mean, I, I just, uh, I'm nervous enough synchronizing documents, you know, with another person. I don't think that um, editing it live is where I would be headed. But then again, I'm not, uh, you know, 18 years old in, in college or whatever. So maybe this is something that uh, the kids will want to do. Maybe. Someone suggested online that this is a way to get them when they're young too, right? I mean, oh, yeah. for, for this coming generation of people... Uh, I, I, don't, I have not seen evidence to this, but it, it is uh, likely, in knowing what we know about these people, that you know, maybe they don't think of Microsoft Office immediately when they think about writing things for school. And maybe this is a way to get them you know, into the office uh, family of products, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, I could see why they're doing it, but it just seemed odd from a point of view of a business. Well, uh, Facebook, I, you know, <laughs> Facebook is interesting because it started, obviously, as a college-type thing. Right. But I, I'd say today Facebook is for everybody, right? I mean, there's all kinds of people on Facebook. Yes, that's true. Uh, kids, adults, older people. I mean, it's it's kind of the word. It's turned into AOL. It's I, universal. Be, yeah, yeah, that's true. It's a comparison before. Um, yeah, I, I think in some ways, now that this has happened, the more interesting thing is going to be to see who else, if anyone, uh, does something similar. You know, what, what other companies might benefit from doing something like this, you know, uh, publicly, you know, with their own friends list or whatever. Right, right. And we'll, we'll see. 
who knows? But it's a it's a very interesting move given uh, Microsoft's uh, desire to uh, best Google Docs. Now they have right. kind of a business version, and now they have like the home version. Yeah, and that, so, that yeah, they and have it went four hundred million being, people using or potentially right. I mean, uh, they went from having nothing to everything. You know, <laughs> yeah, and and the line has always been well, uh, you know, Microsoft Office is more powerful, but it's not on the web, and now it's on the web, and it's like well. Google Docs? What? <laughs> you know, I mean, why? I mean, you know. I don't know why. Uh, I st we still use Google Docs. I, uh, maybe yeah. it's just my uh, hereditary antipathy towards anything from sure. Redmond. Sure, sure. Which you know well. It's a, yeah. it's a disease. No, and that, that, that's fine. That's fine. It's a disease. I, I, I can't. We'll get you, man. We're going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what gets me? You know what I really like? And I've told you this before. I love Windows Live. And Wave 4 is, yeah. uh, is, is on the way, right? I know. And I've been dying, dying. You've known about this. about this. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, dying, <laughs> you know, and 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 it's it's funny. Um, they they made a very high level statement, uh, almost a statement of intent. It was like uh, we are going to start talking about it now, you know, was, which was the basically the blog post. So there were some there were some high level details in there, not enough, you know. But again, I would just say um, broadly speaking, over the next um, several weeks and months, obviously. Windows Live Wave 4 will come together. Explain what this is for people who don't know what you're talking about. I mean, there's live.com. Yeah. So Windows Live is Microsoft's um, uh, suite of consumer-oriented, largely consumer-oriented uh, products and services, it was right? It so there kind are, of the lab stuff, wasn't it? Well, actually, it was originally MSN, I think is the way to think really? of it. Really? Oh, and, yeah. and the weird okay. thing is there's actually an MSN now, <laughs> you know, still. Um, MSN has maybe the most convoluted history of any Microsoft product or service as far as far as its you know its points <laughs> and its its focus and so forth but um, it, it is it is the combination of online services like hotmail and its instant messaging service and photo sharing service and the skydrive uh, storage service and other services you know calendar and so forth with uh, end user applications, you know, that uh, over the past uh, two generations of products, Microsoft has described as, you know, completing or lighting up Windows. You know, they're sort of the final value add. So these are such things as, you know, uh, the Windows Live Mail product, the, end, the, the actual installable application that runs in Windows for email, a photo gallery application, uh, Windows Live Movie Maker, uh, Writer, which is a blogging product, the IE uh, toolbar, and these things and others, you know, there's other parts of it. Um, all are part of what's called Windows Live Essentials. And those are the applications that you download and install in your PC. And I think the, the point of Windows Live overall is, is really about integration. And it's the integration between things on your PC and things up on the web. There are pieces that run on mobile phones, and you can integrate all those things there. There's synchronization services, um, the ability to sync you know, photos across different PCs, so your photo collection is always the same on each PC access uh, data that you have up in the cloud, regardless of what device you're using and so forth. You know, it, Windows Live is the basis for that Windows Live ID, the authentication system Microsoft has for that, you know, the single sign-on service. It's the basis for your gamer tag on Xbox Live. It's the basis for your, uh, whatever the ID is called on the Zune, your Zune gamer tag, whatever it's called, the Zune ID. Um, it is, you know, it's their online service. It's their consumer-oriented uh, brand, you know, for uh, both for web services and for these applications that, that complete Windows. So Wave 4 is the fourth generation, right, uh, of these products and services. And, and the services are going to happen first. And we're talking about Hotmail and the other stuff that's up in the cloud. And then the uh, Windows Live Essential applications, starting with Messenger and then the other applications. So these things, over, again, over the next uh, few months will all be happening and again, I, I, you know, there's not a lot I can say about them. I mean, Microsoft's made some kind of broad statements about each of these, but um, it's very exciting. And it's sort of like the last season of Lost where uh, the answers are all going to come finally, <laughs> you know, where there were holes in the strategy before. You know, for example, last year uh, they released a uh, Windows Live Calendar product, which is fantastic on the web, but then didn't offer a way to synchronize it down to your phone which is really weird, you know, or they have this Hotmail service, which is used by 350 million active users. And the only way you can synchronize that thing to a device or to your PC is either via POP3, which is ridiculous, or uh, through Outlook with this Outlook connector. 
which is very specific to one application is, and is not universal. So these issues are all going to be fixed. Um, there's been some, we talked about PC to PC synchronization last week. Um, part of Wave 4 is a consolidation of those services, uh, rebranding of Yay. sorts, and yes, they're going to fix it. So um, I can't say much more than that, I guess, <laughs> but that's sort of where we're at with uh, Windows Live. So um, again, I'm, I'm excited to finally be able to start talking about it, but um, I, I, you know, I want to get it out. I, I'd like to see people have the chance to play with it too. So um, soon, I guess. Do you get it works. automatically? Uh, if you did the downloader and uh, you already have many of those things, will they automatically update in Windows Update or do you have to go out and get new stuff? Yeah, so uh, the services will update over uh, themselves, right? I mean, that's okay. the beauty of a web service, right? So right. one day you'll hit Hotmail and you it'll just have to be... do anything, right? Yeah. Now, the Windows Live uh, Essentials applications, the way that's going to work is uh, those are updated through Windows Update. So if you have uh, turned on that type of updating or you've at least asked to be notified, you can go in there and say, hey, look, there's an update. You can check it out. Now, I think during the beta, the way it's going to work is you'll have to go and explicitly download the beta to try it out, right? I can't imagine that they would uh, advertise a beta version of Windows Live Essentials, but, you know, who can say? You know, I think, you know, you missed the most important story of the week. <laughs> okay. I often do, Leo. Microsoft is releasing all of those great touch applications. Oh, no, no. That's my sec. See? Well, that's oh, my sec I didn't get down uh, that far. Okay, I won't say no, no, that. I, I told you I had a second one. That was it. Oh, it's not on the list. Oh, I know. I told you it was a Talk surprise. about burying the lead. It's at the end. Nope. <laughs> all right. Stay right, tuned for that. And... The case of the missing iPhone. I want to hear Paul's thoughts on uh, this. It's just it's it's occupying everybody. Plus a yeah. couple of Microsoft controversies a week. Before we do that, though, can I mention, if you don't mind, please do the drobo. I like saying the drobo. I'll put all of your stuff on a drobo. You know what drobo is? Drobo is the uh, original expanding line of storage products. They started off with the original Drobo with four, not one, not two, not three, but four disk bays. You could mix and match hom homogeneous uh, size drives. I had my first Drobo had like 160, a 250, a 500, and a 360 or something like that. And instead of saying, oh, you're all 160, as Raid would do, it adds them all up. It sets aside about a third for maybe a quarter for uh, redundancy, and boom, bang, bah, you've got... An incredible uh, high-speed array of absolutely robust storage. You don't have to worry about drive dies. No problem. You put in another drive, and it continues to work and rebuilds itself, and you never missed a, a beat. Great for home users. Great for storing that iTunes library with all those movies and music or maybe their photo collection or family videos or put it all in there. Then they did the Drobo S. You thought five, four drives was good. How about five drives? With higher performance, too. Good for creative professionals, photographers, designers. Then the Drobo Pro for small businesses and creative teams with eight disk bays. I think we have a couple of those upstairs. Then the Drobo Elite, eight disk bays, but it's a SAN, a storage area network, network storage that can handle up to 16 simultaneously connections over its two gigabit Ethernet ports, iSCSI support. Great for it's VMware certified. Uh, great for virtualization for small businesses, for video editors, for teams who want to work on files all at once. And now the new Drobo FS. I mean, these guys are just uh, as as Gary V would say, crushing it, <laughs> crushing it. He probably shouted a little louder, crushing it. Go Giants! So if you go to, I'm sorry, I Jets, had to say that. It's a Jets, Jets, man. Jets. That's it, not Giants. Jets. Go Pats. He would just he would stab himself in the back if he heard you say. I that. know. Oh, I'm in deep trouble now. Gary's never going to live. Let me let me live. If you Not go that right, there's any difference between those two teams. As far as please. I'm concerned, it's all the same. <laughs> if you're a Patriots fan, what do you care? Drobo.com slash Windows Weekly is the place to go for uh, coupons, instant rebates up to five hundred dollars off when you buy a Drobo model plus hard drives at the Drobo store. Just go to drobo.com slash Windows Weekly. There's videos there. It'll explain what all the different Drobos do. There's owner videos, including Victor Cayo there. I love it. Choose from the Drobo, the Drobo 5, the Drobo FS, the Drobo Pro, and the Drobo Elite. Available now with capacities up to 16 terabytes. You're, You're a, a terabyte. You're a terabyte. 
Go to drobo.com slash MacBreakWeekly. I love these guys. I love their stuff, and I know you will, too. Oh, should I, should... My, my... You're a terabyte? <laughs> my, my, my family is stuck on this brand of humor now. You're a terabyte. So, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, you're heterogeneous. <laughs> <laughs> you got the it. The best one I saw what is. I, oh, I can't remember it anymore. <laughs> I, my, I, some of them are such non sequiturs. Be, I'm the, using the le it. The least they make sense, the better they are. Good. You're a terabyte. Put all of your stuff on a Drobo. You bet. D-R-O-B-O dot com slash Windows Weekly. We now return to our program. Mr. Paul Thorot. Yes, sir. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, the WNBA, because I know you're, you're champing at the bit to do so. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> Actually, I'd like to ask a question. Yes. It's arguable that more people watch this podcast than watch the oh, WMA. Easily. Easily. So why why am I not wearing a Bing logo on my shirt every day and being paid by Microsoft? Excellent question. Right? So the W I mean, look at this. Let's see this thing right here. You could put the Bing logo right on this. Right this there. Instead of high, let's say Bing. Yep. Maybe because you're not an Amazon, a gorgeous golden girl of a woman warrior shooting hoops. Uh, the, okay, and, that's and true. Breaking hearts. That's true. I'm just saying I'm for sale. I, I don't understand. <laughs> I'm available, he says. Yeah. Did I say Mac Break Weekly? I didn't say Mac Break Weekly. I don't think you did. I said Windows Weekly. I didn't hear it. Drobo.com slash Windows Weekly. Uh, here, here, watch. We'll do this. The editors, the magic of editing. My mouth will move, and out of it will come <laughs> but the But it has to be someone words. else's voice. It would say... Windows Weekly. Windows Weekly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do that. Tony, would you do that? Just add Windows Weekly. He'll so be like I'll... watching a Korean, you know, karate movie. <laughs> Gargantua. It's him. Uh, yeah. uh, no, I hope I said that right. It's Windows Weekly. So um, let's see here. The WNBA, have we said all that needs to be said about this? What, their their jerseys say well, Bing? I, <laughs> yeah, we, we're moving on. Yeah, they're, uh, Microsoft, and here's the funny part about this story to me. They're the latest company to buy space on the front of a WNBA jersey. So apparently other companies have done this before. Oh, it's but the front. Yeah. Hmm, not the back. And I wonder if when they call fouls, if they have to say, the the foul was on Bing number 10. <laughs> is it, really? Is there a number like Bing number 10? That would be really funny. Wow. It would be funny. Yeah, I think we're done with that. Okay, that's, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Now to the Microsoft. I felt obligated to mention it. Oh, I think it's good. Maybe I could find a, a picture of the WNBA and Bing together. Is it on your blog? No. <laughs> no. Right. I, you know, I, this is one thing I, I don't think people understand. I don't cover everything on purpose. Like, to me, I, you know, jeez, uh, whatever. I mean, maybe Friday and short takes when I do a bunch of little blurbs, maybe... If I could dredge some kind of humor out of this, maybe I will mention it. In fact, I think I wrote something. Yeah, I did in the joke. Uh, we can cue the joke about a second-rate search engine being on a second-rate sports franchise. Oh, you know, ow. Kind of ow. I'm not saying being as bad. There's probably saying, being on some NASCAR, too. I'm just saying that that would be the humor. That would, that be. would be. You the, wouldn't that, say that. As, as the late-night comedian that I am, that's the direction I would go. Yeah, but you don't, and we like that. Bing is a high-quality search engine. I'm not actually making fun of it. I, I just, I'm just saying that's where my mind drifts so the seattle storm yep there's the jersey instead of yep. saying storm across the front it says bing. It says bing you know what the next step up is is for the seattle storm and this will be the last thing that happens before the WNBA goes out of business by the way is they can change their team name to bing you know why we not? already why, why not? not you already sponsor you're stadiums playing, and yeah what? you're playing in so, you know, pepco field or whatever well, I was going to say, so I, I assume that most W not actually being a guy and not actually knowing anything about the WNBA, I assume that these teams play in NBA stadiums, not in their own stadiums. That's my assumption. Thus, they don't have a naming capability for the stadium. They can't right. make money that way. They could. But they could make money sell the team name. selling their own names. Right? Brilliant. You're brilliant. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you. And now I shall retire. <laughs> You're the, you're the, what is his name? Stern. You're the, uh, not Howard, not Daniel. David, David, David Stern. Stern of David the, Stern w of the WNBA. WNBA. I'm assuming that person's name is actually Daniela or something. You <laughs> made an interesting assumption. You assume that women are the people who watch the WNBA. I don't know why you would think that. If you're, well, 
I don't know how far we want to go in this direction. Okay, okay, let's stop right Have here. Have you ever actually watched a WNBA game? This is what happens to Don Imus, and it's just downhill from here. <laughs> no, it didn't. I, it didn't. I, wow, okay. I don't want to go there. Forget okay. I said it. How about instead Sorry. of the Leo controversy of the week, which I seem to be adept, by the way, it's crazy. But we're not going to turn this into the Paul controversy of the week. You're the one that said that. <laughs> let's make it the Microsoft controversy of the week. This is what okay. the show's about. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, I wasn't sure where you were going with that. Another okay. bullet dodged. Yes, sir. Actually, there are two. There are two. One. Yep. One is real. Real. One imagined. One is fake. The fake one really peeved my cheese. Tell me why. Tell me why. So the, the fake one. The yeah, guy is the guy taking a picture of his nipple, right? Right, because everyone wants to see that. So it's in an ad. Supposedly, I haven't seen it, but supposedly yeah. there was an ad for the Microsoft Kin, and at one point, a guy, it's not a girl, super quick. It's it's quick. Goes I mean, you have like to really shoots, sticks yeah. his phone in his shirt, this up his shirt and takes a picture. Yep. Which you my know, son does done. all the freaking time. We've been drunk. I mean, everyone has done. Everybody's this. done that. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen anyone do that. But anyway, okay. I'm old. It's okay. I, I, I can remember right being places. young. I, I don't yeah. recall doing that, yeah. but okay. No. Okay. Well, you didn't have camera phones when you were then. You, you wouldn't stick a brownie up your shirt. An Instamatic. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Okay. So that's a bogus one, and they did edit it. They, they took it out. So what, what, why, what, what bugs you about it? Because it's so bogus. It's no, fake, I understand. Right? I understand. It's, it's, a, it's a ginned up controversy. I understand. Well, that... actually, I take it a step further. I actually think Microsoft did this on, on purpose. purpose. And by Microsoft, I mean some ad company made it, showed it to them, and they said, yes, we're going to do I mean, someone had to okay this, right? I mean, Microsoft didn't make it, but someone had to say, yeah, we're going to go with this thing. And I honestly think someone, you know, thought, yeah, this is a little much. But because Microsoft is trying desperately not to be that slow conservative company we were just talking about, and the kin is targeted at this market, which is very young and hip and dynamic, I think they were thinking we're going to push this a little far and, and see if we can't get people to complain about it and turn this into a controversy and then people will be thinking kin. Maybe. That's what that's how I view it. People thought it was creepy and that it was kind of upshirt. Right? I think it is creepy. And I, I it's weird. I have, I have zero interest in promoting this. <laughs> so the reason I didn't cover this is I just think it's fake and stupid. Okay. And it, by the way, this isn't even in America. You know what this? You know what these pictures are? What? These are pictures of the party that was at your house. Oh yeah, this is my Windows Seven house party. No, I meant the one your daughter had, where the. Uh... Oh, this probably was where the laptops <laughs> disappeared. Yeah, I'm Pops. sure there was some upshirt. You lose more than one laptop. Okay, wait a minute. Here we go. Here we go. The guy in the t-shirt. Watch the guy in the t-shirt. He's about okay. to do something reprehensible. Everybody's po going. Look, I think it's bad enough there were people in panda heads. I was just going to say, was that a farm animal? I think it was a farm. Oh, look what he just did. Oh, my God. Wait, let's see that again. <laughs> really? Oh, you know, it's, not, it's, not, it's more like his belly. I, this whole thing is just ridiculous. It's his belly. And the flash goes off, and then he laughs. And then he, what is he doing? Is he sending it to somebody? Oh, there it is. I see it. And she's laughing, and they're all having a good time. Because this fat but they guy. they didn't show us a part where she dials nine one one. Yeah, right. I'm I'm being <laughs> you know, uh, inappropriately harassed. Creepy guy. Wait a minute. What is that? Is that the kin? That's so. It looks like yeah, a it's, pebble. Yeah, it's one of the. It's the kin one. And it's smaller than a drum. Yeah. That's it's teeny. It's teeny. It is cute. It's a nice little phone. Well, I can see why. I mean, it is kind of a big part of the storyline. Yep. So I could see why maybe people. Any were. anytime I see you know these kind of manufactured, we're hipper than you are kind of youngster party videos, I just it doesn't. Do you don't, first of all, I get so tired. I just couldn't. no young person watches this 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 commercial and says, "Oh, I want that phone," especially after that. Sure. sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was unpleasant. It's like yeah, the phone that's preferred by stalkers everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know. In our I chat room, Tex and their chat room says, no, 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 you don't understand. He's sending a picture of a mole to his dermatologist. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So that's uh, it was, yeah. it's really good for, it's a medical thing. We're not right. messing around here. That's good. See, that's all Microsoft had to say. Yeah. What? You have dirty minds. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the imagined controversy. Here's the real yeah. one. Here's the real one. And, it's, and this is it's kind this of like, issue. well, it well, is. But, I mean, listen, um, uh, uh, 
some time ago, I, I made a crack, I think, in a blog post where I talked about the slave labor that Apple uses to build their products. And someone wrote me and said, oh, you know, screw you, throw out you. Anti-Apple. I said, no, 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 this is everybody. When I, when I complain about Google and their China baloney, when I complain about the, you know, designed by Apple in California, but it's really made in China kind of stuff. And then we look at Microsoft, who does exactly the same thing. This stuff is all wrong, no matter how you slice I it. Agree. And this, all, this is just fat, lazy Americans want the cheapest freaking products we can get. And we don't actually care if for that to happen, that the people who are making them are slaves. Right. And are being mistreated every single day. And that's okay with us because we just want cheap stuff. And I, I, to me, this is actually a huge problem. And uh, I, when, when Google pulled out of China, sort of, my contention at the time was Microsoft and Yahoo should not be in China. Right. You know, uh, I, I don't understand, you know, the way you fix problems like this is you don't do business with this place until they fix the problem. And, and that's how it goes away. You know, working within the laws of the country that you're in, no. That, that doesn't solve problems other than, uh, you know, allowing us to get a Microsoft mouse made five cents cheaper than they could do it in Bangladesh or wherever the next place down would be. I mean, I just, this whole thing to me is disgusting. And now that I've explained why I'm, I'm <laughs> upset about it, we should probably explain what the story is, right? Yes, what is it, the story? It, They're using Chinese so, labor. Uh, Microsoft, like everyone, you know, like all other consumer electronics company companies, is doing business with partners in China who uh, obviously use labor from that country. And in this case, uh, one of their partners who owns uh, two businesses that have various factories employ uh, teenagers, so people who are under 18, uh, and basically it's slave labor. They are uh, working in horrible conditions, can't take breaks, um, are bunking together in unsafe conditions and so forth. Um, you know, Microsoft, of course, does their sort of due diligence where they... Um, you know, well, we, we audit these people and, you know, there's no problems and, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's cute. But, I mean, you know, obviously they're not telling you, you know, what's really going on. And, I, you know, by doing business with these people, I mean, all you're really doing is uh, guaranteeing that they'll be fighting each other to be the cheapest. And the only way you can really do that in a country that basically has no regulations whatsoever is, uh, you know, they break, you know, they, they do what they do. And um, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I mean... I, maybe I'm not an economics major, but it seems like it, could we pay five bucks more per mouse and move this thing somewhere else? I, I'm not saying it makes economic sense to move it to the United States necessarily, but couldn't there? I mean, there must be somewhere halfway between there and China that you know that could make these things. I mean, I just think this is terrible. It's are too we, bad. Are we? We're kind of culpable uh, as consumers because we really do put yes. the pressure on the company to to make this stuff cheap, and we'll cheap. buy it a buck cheaper. We will buy Without the cheap one. a question about yep. why it's cheaper. Yep. And I blame myself on that. I mean, I don't... No, know. we're all part of the problem. Absolutely. I, of course. No, in my office right now, there are... We're full. Uh, we're chock-a-block with stuff made hundreds by... Hundreds of little plastic boxes yeah. all made in China. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, almost everything. Yep. Uh, I think the question, though, is really... I mean, do, it, what, what's the best way to fix this? Is it for us to uh, stop buying? I don't. It's, it's for us to pressure companies and governments... To encourage I think the, China the, the to do the right thing, yeah, I must have the right idea. Oh, Leo, buttons. Just, uh, <laughs> no, if it's not a, if it's got a zipper, I'm not going to use it. That's right. The zipper is the tool of the devil. It is. You know, anything more complicated than a pulley, I'm out. I'm <laughs> there out. you go. And even the pulley, and is no a one who has suspect. worn a pulley has ever done any <laughs> yeah, suspect. So right. that's good. there you good go. Choice. That's right. <laughs> Name one crime uh, committed with a pulley. I ask they, you. They one crime that hasn't been committed with a pulley. Oh, know? really? I guess if you were lifting bank safes out of uh, basements, you need a pulley. <laughs> something. Okay. You need a something. Yeah. Uh, so what is your take, as long as we're talking about uh, yes. see me endeavors, uh, what is your take on this Gizmodo iPhone leak? So you, you hear the story that a guy from Apple uh, went out drinking left an, a prototype iPhone on a table and then it got into the hands of Gizmodo? Really? For $5,000. I mean, I, I, it sounds ludicrous. I mean, it, it, it you sounds... You don't believe it. No, I'm, no what do you not think happened? I, I think it did happen. I mean... Um, oh, no, it happened. I, I think the only question is what really happened, right? In right. other words, I, I, what I just said, That's I think happened. That's the story. Happened. Well, it happened. I mean, you know... Uh, Gizmodo paid for it. You know, I have my own uh, attitudes and opinions about these gadget blogs and so forth. But 
I would just say that um, the only real question here to me is whether or not it was deliberate. And I think that uh, there are a lot of people who would say that Apple would never do this thing because they have a certain kind of way of being secretive and they do things in a certain way. But, you know, that might be why they did it this way this time. I mean, they're not dumb. Right. Uh, it, it, it's astonishing to me that such a young guy would be allowed to bring an iPhone out into the world like that, you know, a prototype iPhone, and then that he would actually leave. I mean, listen... Um, I, I guess I would put it this way. When, when, when I got married, before I got married, I went and I bought my, my wife a, a ring. And so I would have been 22 years old, somewhere around there. And I remember walking out of the store with this ring, which is this teeny, teeny thing that would be so easy to drop into a grate and lose forever. Or, you know, you put it in your pocket and then you arrive where you're going and it's not there anymore. I was scared to death of it because, A, it cost more than most of the cars I'd ever owned up to that point. It was uh, an incredibly expensive and, and crazy thing. You know, it was, it was scary to have, be carrying this thing around. Don't you think that this guy would have viewed the iPhone in that same way? I mean, wouldn't this guy have been more afraid of Steve Jobs than I would have been of my wife to be? <laughs> you know? uh, if he wasn't, he is now. Yeah. He's I mean, having a very bad, seems, very bad week. I guess, I mean, listen, nothing's impossible. It doesn't, and so do you think it was stolen? That's what I think. I think that the story that we've been told is not completely correct. Something's fishy. So either this guy really did have the thing with him and someone swiped it, or maybe this was a plant. According to John yeah. Gruber, your favorite person in the world, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is uh, SOP for Apple. Uh, when they have a new phone, they put it in a case that makes it look not like a prototype, but like a, a, an iPhone in a case. Yep. And they send a few, a handful, a half dozen engineers out and about, let them use it because they need to, you know, especially a cell phone, you need to test it in different places and yeah. see how, the, you know, how it works. And this guy was the, a baseband engineer. He was a radio engineer. So okay. it would be not not impossible, not impossible. That, yep. that he had a phone that he was we've seen pictures on Flickr especially as you get close to the release of the iPhone now a Gruber also says that his sources at Apple tell him that the serial numbers make sense and that from the serial numbers from the from the the barcode on the back let me run to his website during fireball.net uh, he could that that is a giveaway that the phone was uh, a prototype. It had N90, and according to sources familiar with the project, N90 is Apple's code name for the fourth generation GSM iPhone slated for release in June or July. And yep. then DVT, which stands for Dev Design Verification Test, an, right, a, a right, production right, right. milestone. Uh, so uh, okay. that all makes sense. I think the yep. guy had it. He was out and about. Now, did he leave it on a bar stool? No yeah. I, freaking I, that seems... way. That's what, and that's what I mean. In other words, myself as a young guy, I, scared to death of losing this thing. I mean, you know how, you know how you act when you have something valuable and you're afraid of losing it. I mean, it's inconceivable that he would leave it somewhere. No, I mean, I just, I, I not impossible, but now the bar highly unlikely. They, the, uh, uh, somebody, seen it or somebody asked the bartender, and he said, "Yeah, this guy kept calling like all day and all night, and the next day saying, if you have you found anybody found the phone?'" So it's possible he thinks it slipped out of his pocket. But, Here's what I think. Well, on the other side, though, supposedly the guy who found it spent a bunch of time trying to get it back. Yes, because he never did the one thing that you but and I would I, have done. Well, leave it at the bar. You give it to the freaking bartender. <laughs> of course, because where's the guy going to go back to uh, to find it? If you I mean, have ever found anything simple. in a bar, a diamond ring, yep. a wallet, yeah, what you whatever, doing? you put it on the bar and you say, bar, barkeep, somebody left this behind. This guy took it. He took the phone. He, it was a stolen phone. There's no the doubt in my mind. And by the way, he then took money, right, oh, the for the a, stolen the merchandise. A he's a thief. I, I think he's going to have some issues. And he's a thief that was smart enough to recognize that that well, was what not what is, it looked to be, that it was an Apple why, prototype. Why did we out, so why was the guy from Apple outed what I and the guy who stole it wasn't? Not. Isn't that, uh, I, that, that that's crazy? And, I, and, and I, I, I that's one of the problems I have with this site. I, I agree. That is just the absolute wrong way to do things, and it's it it is a, a testimony to the sad state of the so called, you know, tech journalism that we have today. That these clowns paid some thief five thousand dollars and then outed the poor guy from Apple who whatever lost the phone or however it's the it happened. Lowest of the low. It is pathetic, and I, I'm I, you know, I I just. That's disgusting. 
I have it to really, confess. It's really upsetting. I did a bad thing. Because when okay. I first saw that article, I immediately yeah. tweeted a link to the article and said, you do not want to be this guy. And I said his name. And I regret that. I can't. You can't take it back once you tweet something. Sure. Uh, but I was so, it was like, oh, my God, this poor guy. And then I realized after the fact, well, I'm just contributing to this, the right. outing this guy. So I haven't said his name since, and I we won't in the podcast and everything. Oh, I, I just, God, God, I just don't even I feel understand for it. It's, it's unbelievable. If he was and drunk. And you, you read their rationale for everything oh, they've done, and they say, well, he was going to be outed anyway. Well, yeah. really? Uh, how, how was that going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? I, I, the whole thing is just, I, it really bothers me. It's me just, it's terrible. Sad. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, well, it's, the, it's where we've come to. And again, you know, the only people we can blame in some ways are ourselves for reading this. You know that Gizmodo got 150. Of course it did. But one, I'm sorry, 1 million views that yep. day, that hour. Right. Fantastic. That hour. I mean, they, it was a huge no, it's, success. It's everything that's wrong with this industry in one beautiful little story. Yeah, we all ran to look at it. Yep. Sad. You wouldn't do link bait, would you? <laughs> I don't know if I want to answer that question, Leo. <laughs> Why do you ask? <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's link bait and then there's link bait though. Let's let's be honest. I mean, I we all want to get hit. Done anything like what they did? Never would any of us done that. Now, some, now yesterday, Listen, it, okay, go ahead. Somebody Listen. said, "What if?" Yep. The guy came and knocked at the door of the cottage. Said, "I got something. Look at this. I think it's the next Apple phone. What would I have done? I certainly would have offered him five thousand. And if he'd asked for money, I would have called the police. But right. I, mean, I might have looked at it." Would you have looked at it? Yes. Well, let's put it this way. If I were you and, and I have the uh, video publishing resources that you have in this live feed and so forth, I, I, I would think that one of the things I wouldn't do would be to look at it and say, we got to get this thing on air right now. I would say, I will investigate this. Can I have this for a certain amount of time and look into it? You know, that kind of thing. Absolutely. I mean, there, there is a, a case to be made for journalism, right? Um, just because the a public's company right like to it. know, right? Well, by the way, that's don't don't say that. You know that that yes, absolutely. Um, no, just I mean, I'm saying that. I mean, it's not the Pentagon Papers, but yeah, I mean that's doesn't our matter. job. It, you know what? It doesn't matter. Just because a company doesn't want you to know about it doesn't mean that you don't have a right to publish information about that thing. Um, it's not so much that uh, you know. Okay, so they paid for this information. Uh, you know. Uh, Rags pay for information on celebrities. I mean, it's normal. They play. They pay paparazzi for photos of no, celebrities. Gar Gawker says it doesn't. Uh, it says we. They, they say without apology, we do checkbook journalism. Sure. Okay. So I mean, that's one of the ways you can you know win or whatever. Um, that's that's a competitive issue. Fine. It's just that I think my big issue with this story was the way they outed the guy, and I think the other issue I have with it is that parts of the story just don't ring true to me. Right. And, uh, you know, I can't, I wasn't there. And I, you know, I mean, like I said, anything is possible, but uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, it, it stinks, doesn't it? I mean, it does. And the funny thing is we didn't really learn anything of, of significance about the phone that we won't know in a couple of months. That do we, I mean, we don't even really care. No, but we thought about the phone. Gaga for information about this stuff right up front. You know, I mean, we got to know now. Yeah, but it's not, but who even knows if this is what the phone looks you like? You know, I, I didn't have time to research this. Um, I, I hope that the the kind of case thing that it's in is not the actual case. It reminds me of these compact laptops that they sold for a really long time that it's kind of like the silver band around the outside. Um, I, I mean, I hope that's not the look. I know. <laughs> you know I, I kind of don't like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it looks kind of, you know, whatever. But whatever. I mean, um, iPhone is a tremendous smartphone. The next one's going to be great. Software looks great. I mean, uh, so, yeah, big surprise. Let's talk about uh, the Dell Windows 7 yeah. phone. Doesn't that look slick? <laughs> what do you think? I think it looks good. I mean, it's got I, a I, keyboard. It's like a it's pixie. Got a, it's got, it's weird. It's, it is like a, well, it's like a, uh, like the Palm Pre actually, right? Because it's a slider phone. Oh, it's a slider. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it is a slider. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, uh, I, I don't want a slider phone. In fact, my, one of the many things that changed for me, and then we can thank the iPhone was for this, was, when I went to the iPhone uh, from uh, a Motorola Q device on the Verizon network, right, I had various issues with the iPhone right up front, including the quality of the network, the lack of certain functionality like copy and paste and so forth. 
And then the keyboard, right? I found the virtual keyboard to be a little bit tough. Now, two years into this, obviously, the Apple has fixed a lot of the uh, software issues with the iPhone. Uh, AT&T has fixed some of the issues, not all, um, with their network. And uh, some of these issues go away. And I, I have to say, when I look forward to Windows Phone 7, I think I don't need a hardware keyboard. You know, uh, my wife, who got an Android phone last with fall, I yeah. uh, got a Droid. Uh, assuming, like I did, that she would want this hardware keyboard, and what she finds is she never uses it. So I think if she could have done it again, she might have gotten a, a different phone, one that didn't have a hardware keyboard, and thus was uh, smaller and lighter and, and so forth. When you, when you look at that phone, by the way, the, the Dell Lightning phone, I think one of the things that strikes me the most is, imagine how thin and beautiful that thing could be if it didn't have the keyboard. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, it wouldn't be as thin as just that slider bit, obviously, because the stuff is still, you know, in that bottom part They're of the case. They're aiming this at business, though. Business, don't business people want the keyboard? Yeah, and that might be the rationale for it's it. It's kind of so, their uh, droid, uh, really. It's very much... It's, uh, yeah. Well, re you know, people, I think, don't understand... Um, Microsoft has been talking about the, the, the multi-touch, capacitive touch screen stuff and obviously we've seen the higher res version um display with the you know bigger displays and so forth um there are going to be all kinds of different form factors some of them are going to have slide out hardware keyboards like this one some of them are going to have the hardware slide out keyboards that come out on the side where you rotate it and use it with two hands uh, many of them will not have keyboards it's going to be all kinds of different form factors so this is just one um it looks great. I mean, I, th I think that the reality of Windows Phone is that these phones are going to be pretty cool, by and large. Um, but, you know, they won't all have these uh, exact hardware layouts. Think, and by the way, this is an Engadget scoop of a leaked Dell document, so it's just another one of these. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> and if you read it, you get all the goober stuff you get at these gadget sites. It's like, oh, it's snipper keen. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then, you know, 24 minutes later, they're on to the next thing. I mean, right. you know, okay, good for you, but... Um, not a lot of insight there. Uh, it's a giga, gigabyte uh, of a flash, 5 to 12 megs of RAM. That's a lot. 8 gigs of storage on a micro SD card. Yep. OLED nice. display, great. Uh, Snapdragon gigahertz, great. I mean, it's got some nice stuff. Yeah. I tell you, we are in a golden age of smartphones. That's one thing that's very clear. Between the uh, HTC oh, yeah. Incredible, this new iPhone coming out, these uh, great Windows Series 7 phone, Series secret phones, and all of the other, what is it, Windows Phone 7. Oh, Leo. WP7. You have about five months to get this straight. <laughs> I, I never will get <laughs> and this I straight. Expect you it to took do me so. a long time when Mac <laughs> Apple changed the power books to MacBooks. Yeah. It just couldn't it took me Yes. Right. I'm right. still writing two thousand nine on my checks. I'm just yeah. I'm, I don't do with deal with change well. It's just it's a limitation of me. Don't deal with change well. It's me limitation. Did you see, before we get to the Windows 7 feature of the week, which is next, did you see the M McAfee uh, horror that happened yesterday? Only only briefly, because, you know, again, I've been out most of the day, and I, I got some emails about it. And Jeez, Louise. So McAfee, Cisco thing? No, McAfee okay. releases an update to its virus definition files yep. that decides that servicehost.exe is a <laughs> virus. Nice. <laughs> now, I just, uh, not to speak out against McAfee specifically, but what the hell? I mean, I hate so them. awful. I, I just, I just so hate. awful. I think them and Symantec, you know, uh, <sighs> zero interest. Uh, in me this. too. I mean, and, and it's one of the reasons I've I've always rallied around these small and light antivirus, anti malware type packages. And uh, and for years and years, I could I could go look it up. But I think dating back to 2002, I've been begging, pleading with Microsoft, you got to give this functionality away with Windows. I don't understand if you're causing the problem. Right. You should fix the problem. This isn't an antitrust case. This is a this is a need, and uh, I I am not a big fan of these uh, sprawling suites that do all this junk. Uh, I, this is a beautiful example of uh, a product that's been around for too long, and it does all this extra stuff, and we kind of forgot what the point was. Right. And I just don't, I just don't get it. This is the corporate. It's funny. It's the corporate version. Consumers sure. aren't really affected. Uh, and by the way, because it's the corporate version, it's kind of empowered to detect and remove the threat <laughs> so it deleted surface host.exe nice. and what effect did that have well it forces a machine to reboot <laughs> in an endless loop because nice. you can't but you don't Windows actually but the mission accomplished yeah because no now virus. that computer can never be hacked safe 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 it's, it is the perfect mcafee computer According to the Associated Press, a third of the hospitals in Rhode Island were forced to suspend treatment of non-trauma patients in emergency rooms because their computers were rebooting. In Kentucky, state police officers had to shut down computers in the patrol cars. 
Um, <laughs> anyway, it's fixed now. Uh, it's, it went out at 3 a.m. Eastern time. And uh, they... they about Hopefully during one of those reboots, the machines will be able to download the update and, uh, you know, <laughs> fix the problem. <laughs> That's, that's no, afraid little, not. <laughs> good little resolution they got you, there. You're kind of lost now. You lost your service host. I guess you're not running. <laughs> now let's get to uh, speaking of security. Uh, our uh, Windows yeah. uh, Seven <laughs> feature of the week. Yes. So uh, this is Action Center, uh, which is the uh, successor to the Windows Security Center that debuted in Windows XP with Service Pack Two and continued forward in Windows Vista. And it's been upgraded along the way. And uh, in the beginning, obviously, as its name suggests, uh, Windows Security Center was designed to monitor the security tools in your computer, things like the uh, anti-malware that doesn't ship with Windows, which should ship with Windows but doesn't, but also the, you know, the firewall and, uh, and at the time, the Windows Defender anti-spyware tool. Now, in, action, in, uh, sorry, in Windows 7, it's been upgraded yet again and this time around, it actually integrates with the uh, troubleshooting infrastructure that's built into Windows 7. So it looks at uh, maintenance issues. So if it, as time goes by, if you've had problems in your computers, uh, with your computer, it will actually uh, prompt you to send the information to Microsoft so they can try to resolve the problem and get back to you uh, with a possible resolution. And you can also um, uh, run all the troubleshooting uh, wizards and so forth and... Uh, access the recovery tools in your computer from this interface. So it's one of the couple of things that sits down in the, the Windows 7 tray by default. It's, it looks like a little uh, airplane, you know, those little cone flags they have out at airfields. Uh, <laughs> originally, it was a little lighthouse. I don't know. <laughs> it's, a win, it's a windsock. A windsock. Thank you. Yes, I should know that given it's a computer. Yeah. Uh, is that what it is, really? I, I yeah, just thought a, it was a little so, flag. It's a windsock. It's a little flag. I, look, I think of it as a windsock. But yeah, I guess it's a little flag. Yeah, it's meant to, you know... And you don't one need of the Windows does, 7 to know which way the wind blows. That's right. It's always uh, blowing to the right for some reason. Um, it's also a, a place to consolidate um, messages related to, again, the maintenance and security of your system. So I really past, like that. You can now click on it and you'll get to say it has yeah, three yeah. fixes or whatever. It gives you this one place, you know, and, and you know, one of the... Uh, you know, by the way, in the, in the cleaning of my office, I've come across a lot of Longhorn documentation, including these awesome... Aero posters that they gave out in 2003 talking about the Aero people-centric user experience. You know, but, one, <laughs> but one of the things they were going to do in Longhorn that they never did was have a consolidated uh, notification infrastructure. So if you think about Perfect. all of the applications in your computer that pop up their own little notifications, yes. like those damn Adobe things that all oh. updated this past week and we had to reboot our computers an right. uh, infinite number of times. Or Windows Live Messenger. Every time someone logs in, you get little pop, you know, little toast slides up, right? You know, one of the goals in Longhorn was they were going to, all those things would go through this one place and that the notifications would be consistent. They would all come from the same place. They would all look the same. It was a good idea. They never did it. But in uh, in Windows 7, you get uh, sort of a half step toward that. So all of the security and maintenance stuff, assuming using Microsoft software, um, will go through this one place. And it's kind of the right way to do it. So it's a it's a nice little, a little, uh, you know, central console. You can access all that, uh, the security and maintenance stuff in Windows Seven. Wonderful in our chat room says, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, okay. I keep getting this flag to back up. Not gonna happen, dude. <laughs> Knock yourself out, wonderful. <laughs> good, good, good times. <laughs> I am not gonna let a computer tell me what to do, man. That, that is absolutely the right attitude, and uh, yeah, up. you'll be fine. Back up my. What is it? what is it? What is the line you use? <laughs> yeah, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. No, you're fun. You're a Longhorn. <laughs> that was what I said to my wife. I, she said something like, "You know, I was going to say something." And I'm like, "What are you talking about? I wasn't going to say that." She says, "It was a prediction." I said, "You're a prediction." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. That's good. It, you the, guys the know least, how to fight. again. If it doesn't make sense, it's best. You win. Yeah, love it. Yep. It's wonderful. Thunderlicious. <laughs> yes. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, that was our Windows 7 feature of the week. Uh, 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 by the way, a little backstory on that. Something Paul's been doing because there's so many great little things in Windows 7. You mm -hmm. might have missed them. Ew. But it's not a tip. This is the Windows 7 tip of the week. Yes. Actually, this one comes from someone I believe you know. Mr. Paulie Minshaw. Yeah. Hollywood.com. 
Here's right. So here's what's interesting about this one. I haven't written him back yet, but he he recommended this as a tip, and I he had that Hollywood link at the bottom of his email, so I clicked on it because I click on anything. I'm an idiot, and I noticed he had a video that you had made, and he had put music on top of it. And I thought to myself, Oh man, this is going to be a horror show. Like, <laughs> oh no, he's how, good. How lame is this going to be? So I played the video, thinking this is going to be so bad, I'm not even going to publish the tip. That's how bad this is going to be. <laughs> But actually, he's kind of awesome. Oh, he's I mean, really he's, good. Are you he's, kidding? Um, he does yeah, a lot I mean, of like, our theme songs. He's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, of course I've, he is. He's I've, Canadian. Yeah, that explains a lot. Oh, but yeah. He is um, uh, actually very talented. So I, that was... Um, is the video on your site? No, 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 no. I just... It was on... It's um, not that talented. It's on, it's on Pollywood, I think, is where oh, okay. it is. So what is the yeah, tip? So oh, sorry. Or should so, I just play the video? I could play the video. Have you found the video? It's you driving in the car. It is? Yeah, you're in. You're test driving a Ford. Oh wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can find it. That's very funny. It might be his other site. Maybe it's his other site. He had two links. And there's music behind it. Yeah. So he what he did was he, you know, he he made a song, and so uh, it was kind of like a road music kind of thing. And I'm thinking, oh man, this is going to be, this oh, is going to no, be he's terrible. A great composer. How awful is this going to yeah. be? No, I'm, I'm sorry. You know what? It must have been on his uh, his blog. Yeah. He has oh. a different site. Um, I can look it up. Do you want me to look it up? No, I'll no, look it up. No, no. Twit, here it is. Twit, <laughs> Twitmobile music video. I have found it. Okay. It just took us a little while. Yes, this is this is a Lisa well, you driving. See the phone, but you sit on the site and you think, oh my God, this is going to be... It's going to be horrible. It's going to be terrible. Right. It's going to be like a guy with a ukulele or something. The story of this is Lisa, uh, my uh, CEO, we, we were test driving Fords because uh, I wanted to have a Ford with sync in it. Right. And she said, we got to try the Mustang. And she's driving. I'm in the back seat filming and screaming. <laughs> she took us out in this country road. Well, here, just right. watch watch the video. To the Twitmobile. <laughs> He's good, isn't he? Yes. Yes. And that's the thing. Well, There's Tony Wang, our editor. They're agreeing that they're about to make me mess my pants. And now, in a moment, she steps on. I think she got up to like 90 miles an hour. There's Tony. He likes it. He should leave the. He should leave the uh, sound of me screaming like a girl <laughs> as she takes that corner there. I go, ah! But you know what? We bought the car. Yeah. It's my bright red Mustang, baby. Well, you should ask him for the song. Now you can have a theme song. I'm going to play that in my bright red Mustang every time. Yeah, every time I, you leave uh, the driveway. I, I leave the driveway. Thunder right. is moving along. So how does that have anything to do at all? With the tip of the week. With the tip of the week. Because he was the one who recommended it. I get it. It's just like a, a nod to Paul Minshaw. Well, I... I he also did time, many of our other Every themes. time someone emails me, I do a, a, a very deep background check. <laughs> and um, no, he just had this link. I, I think it was because it said Pollywood. Colleen says... And I, and I thought, who is this person? Yeah, no, no, no. He's good. He does a lot of our music. Paul, Colleen says... Leo doesn't scream like a girl. Girls scream like Leo. Just a very important <laughs> distinction. Nice. I was a fine line, a subtle distinction, but an important distinction. You're a girl that screams like Leo. <laughs> so, so, so what is your... So a very tip? simple one. It's the, uh, the bread crumb bars, as it is called in, in Windows Explorer and Windows 7. Um, actually, I believe it debuted in Windows Vista, but it is... Uh, Presence here in Windows 7 as well. And certainly for those people, like we said earlier, a lot of the people coming to Windows 7, of course, uh, skipped over Vista, so this will be new to them. But in previous versions of Windows, by default, the address bar in an Explorer window would give you that path, um, which is okay. But what it doesn't provide is a way to navigate uh, to different parts of the path. So if you have something like C, back, you know, colon backslash program file slash, you know, Hewlett Packard slash whatever, and, you, and you're in this folder and you want to get to program files, you know, you can go back twice if there's an up button. You can use the up button and go up twice or whatever. But 
what the Windows 7 uh, address bar has by default is this breadcrumb bar, and it allows you to navigate around the file system in much more uh, granular ways and in, in actually very powerful ways. So, for example, um, what you see instead is this hierarchy of locations in the file system. So in that example I just provided, you would see computer and then an arrow and then local disk C colon and then an arrow and then program files and then an arrow and then Hewlett Packard and then an arrow and then whatever the folder was. But what the breadcrumb bar allows you to do, among other things, is go to places in the file system that weren't necessarily a place you had been, but fall under this hierarchy. So, for example, you can click the arrow next to program files, and you can access any folder that's under program files right from the address bar. You don't have to navigate back and then navigate in. You can go directly using this pop-up list. It's actually a very powerful feature. And if you, again, if you're coming from XP, it's sort of a revelation that they've taken this thing that's really kind of basic, and you probably never thought too much about it, and they've made it uh, far, far more powerful than it used to be. So it's just a, uh, not just a way to find your way home or, you know, find your way back as you would with breadcrumbs, uh, but also just to find your way anywhere in the file uh, system much more quickly and efficiently than was possible before. I think that, it, didn't that come from the web originally? I mean, websites from seem to have done web. a lot. I don't know. Yeah, no, not necessarily. Well, okay, yeah, I mean, yes, it's possible that a website could offer this kind of navigation through their site. Right. Um, By the way, you like my new T-shirt? What's it? It says. <laughs> it's kind of the, it's the it's the it's the companion piece to your T-shirt. You you, did you just put that on or something? Yeah, I forgot. Oh, about okay. It. <laughs> did, did, so, did it just arrive? For, yeah. For those of you not uh, watching at home, uh, Paul last <laughs> week had a T-shirt that said that had the word "tool" on it and a slash across it, the universal symbol for not a. Right. I have the companion piece because Paul, of course, called me a tool because I like the iPad. I, I actually don't believe I called you a no, tool. No, no. Yeah. You called all of us a tool. The collective, collective. collective iPad lover tools that we are. So <laughs> so okay. thanks to uh, Collins at uh, T-Shirts Plus, he sent me the complimentary T-shirt. It's complimentary with an E. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not, not, not with an I. Complimentary with an I. Yes. Very important <laughs> distinction Yes, from the writer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> there, by the way, there is a band called Tool that has some very nice T-shirts. I'm told. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> this is not one of them. No. Uh, let us move on to uh, Audible, and then we'll get you yes, a uh, couple of uh, software picks of the week because you've got two, two. Okay, two. But first, your Audible this is pick an of the but week. A goodie. I, um, I'm a big fan of Michael Pollan, and. Uh, he uh, actually came out with a, a very short book this year, which is worth getting. Um, not necessarily as an audible book. <laughs> um, in fact, I can't. It's not. It, it's not. It's not even on. You don't want to get a really short one with your. No, free, but your it's a. Book. It's kind of a guide to, you know, what you should eat and, and things about, um, you know, s simple sayings about food that will help you eat correctly. So, for example, uh, don't eat a cereal if it colors the milk. You know that kind of stuff. Very, Never very, eat anything bigger than your head. <laughs> there you go. Um, actually, Americans probably do need that uh, level yes. of detail. So, <laughs> but the original book from him that that, that kind of uh, touched all this stuff off is the Omnivore's, Omnivore's Dilemma, and we've actually never recommended that for some That's reason. A good so, point. yeah, um, this is this book was in fact a revelation to me, and it, it it's uh, I think I put this in the notes. Um, let's see, yeah, I mean, you know, this is the book about how we really are the children of the corn. You know that everything we ingest virtually in the United States, especially. Is somehow based on corn. Thanks to Archer it, Daniels Midland. <laughs> yeah, well, the whole World War II, uh, you know, and the, uh, the farmer subsidization and all that stuff. I mean, it, it, the history of it's crazy, but it's, it's, it's basically all in, manufactured food, and corn makes a very nice uh, cellulose base. Yeah. It's not edible. Yeah, so, you know, uh, the, I think it was the Mayans who were, you know, uh, the, the first people who had right. corn. It's the central part of the diet, and they can go back to these bodies and discover that a certain percentage of their bodies are, in fact, Corn, uh, <laughs> literally, you know, the same uh, genetic so material. We, we are what we eat. Well, Americans are far more full of corn than those guys were. Oh, um, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. dear. So we really are the children of the corn. Wow. Anyway, it's a fascinating book. It's excellent, excellent Oh, it's book. a must read. It kind of launched a movement, frankly, of uh, local 
uh, yep. sustainable uh, f- produce and food. And uh, yeah, and and Dedham has a, a farmers market now. This little town I live in, and I can assure you that you can trace the origins of this thing directly back to this book. You're a yeah. corn. I am a corn. <laughs> uh, that's true. You're a ch- you're a child of the. You're corn. a child of the. The omnivore's dilemma: natural so history for so us. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mean, what? 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 Just me the other aspect of the humor. What the is other that? thing you could do, you know, like I do this with my daughter, for example. Yeah. Like she'll walk in and she'll say, uh, "Hey, where's the orange juice?" And I'll be like, "The orange juice is gone." She'll be like, "Beautiful." And I'll say, "You're beautiful." Oh wait, you know, and, and you do it on purpose. <laughs> it's so it. cute. The whole family. You've got a rhythm, a natural rhythm. You're you're, it's you're the only it's, way we communicate. It's, it's like growing up with Woody Allen. <laughs> we just make fun of each other yeah. all day long. It's good. Only the strongest will survive, Leo. <laughs> You're not sure about my son. I don't think he's going to make it. I, I think I should have done it with my child. <laughs> I'm going to start. Can I? Is it too late to start? It's never too start. Sarcasm is a, is a timeless. Timeless. Yeah, it's, omnip- a, it's a gift. It is it's a, a gift. gift. There's yeah. a, a certain subtlety to the Eura thing, though. Subtlety. I like. Yeah, I like it. Subtlety. Yes, there is, sir. Yes, there is. The omnivore's dilemma can be yours for free if you go to audible.com. Uh, I just got a note from Audible now, 75,000 titles in the library. They're going so fast. And that's partly because uh, people have discovered audiobooks, partly because Audible is really on a mission to bring audiobooks uh, to life in in categories that never had audiobooks before, like science fiction, where you know these publishers, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the classic era of science fiction, they weren't going to make an audiobook of, of Isaac Asimov's stuff or or uh, Robert Heinlein stuff. So Audible said, well, we will then. Yep. Audible has just done a great job. And they've got, I was in New- Newark in their studio. They have nine studios there. They're recording almost all the time and great stuff. The best readers, the best books, and a great way to read when you just, you know, felt like I felt like I read. I was done. I don't have time to read. But there's all this downtime, all this downtime when you're you're in the car and the commute, or even just driving carpool. Yesterday, I was listening to my new book, uh, and because uh, I finished the uh, the Daniel Suarez books, I'm listening. This is actually an odd book. It's Christopher Buckley, William F. Buckley's son, uh, his memoir about the death of his mother and uh, father, mum and pup, and um, it's actually really good. He's a very good novelist, but it's um, you know it's a little bit more serious. It's about you know losing your parents and and so forth, but. Uh, I'm really enjoying it, and Jennifer recommended it to me. But this is the thing: she read it. Right. I she can read. She'll be. I'll look, I'll go to sleep. She's still up an hour later, still reading. I one page. I'm out. I am. I cannot read in bed. Yep. So this saves me. I am able to read these great books by listening to them, and I get. I actually get more reading done than she does. Audible. Dot com. If you go there right now, audible.com slash windows, sign up for the gold account. That's a book a day. And uh, I'm sorry, a book a month. That was wishful thinking on my part. A book a month. <laughs> it's quite a program. And your first one's free. You must read a book a day. No. A chapter a day is all we ask. Audible.com. You know, it is Earth Day, so they've uh, featured on the front, uh, as we record this, Bill McKibben's McKibben's a book, E Earth or E Earth, E A A R T. E Earth. How are you supposed uh, to pronounce that's that? That's good. E-earth. Making a life on a tough new planet. Anyway, great stuff. Audible, you, thank you for the things that you do, and you have changed my life. And uh, I encourage those of you who haven't tried Audible, put it on your Zoom. I had, I was actually at the gym, and there was a guy listening to Audible on his Zoom next to me yesterday. Yikes! I it wasn't. Ju- it was a thirty gig Zoom, the big one. Yeah, amazing. Audible, it's a nice machine. It's a nice. It's rugged. It looks solid now, like a tank. I think it was I brown. like. It. I still like the way that thing looks. Like, so I'm telling you, there's going to be a market for this retro stuff. It's retro. It yeah. looks like re- it, it looks nice. It still looks good to me. Yeah, it's like it was designed. This I have one here. Union. You see mine? Yeah, right here in front of. Me. Let's see. I love mine. I always. I, I always make sure it's synced up. I wish I had the brown one, but it's uh, it's black. That's it. That's so the beautiful. one he was listening to. And by the way, I knew he was a listener because uh, we were waiting in line for the for the machine. And he said, after you, Mr. Laporte. I like a Zune <laughs> owner who's nice. polite. And plus, and treating you as the older gentleman that you are. <laughs> you might as well have said, <laughs> you old geezer. <laughs> no, you're an old geezer. Uh, audible, audible.com slash winners. Give them a try today. I know you're going to love them. And now Paul Therott, not a tool, has yes, his software picks of the week. I do. 
I have two. You know, a few weeks back, we talked about this tool called FixWin, and Microsoft just released their own version of it. Oh, you're week, kidding. Uh, which is really interesting. So um, they've had a service up on the web in beta for a while now called the, the Fixit Center, but, uh, or Microsoft Fixit. So um, the idea is a good one. You know, you go to support.microsoft.com, you have some kind of a problem. And for a lot of the problems, there's a little button that says fix it now. And rather than describing the weird steps you have to go through to fix a problem, it will actually just fix it for you. Love it. But now there's a, a downloadable version of it. And uh, it's really neat. And it, on Windows 7, it, it actually integrates and works proactively with the uh, troubleshooting infrastructure. So you can do things like that. But, it, you know, the one of the more interesting things about this program to me is that if you have XP or Windows Vista, you actually get some of the benefits of the Windows 7 troubleshooting platform without having... Windows 7 installed, although it's, again, it's, it's not really proactive. This but, is so great. Do they make this for the iPad, Paul? <laughs> no, they don't, sir. Oh, shit. Um, because the iPad has no problems. Oh, that's why. Um, but, uh, you know, the interface, uh, for, you know, the manual part of the interface, we actually go and look at, you know, here are the things I can do, here are the things I can fix. It looks a lot like that FixWin program that we talked about, you know, three, four weeks ago. Um, it is very similar. and um, But it's for Microsoft, so uh, this definitely is, This is the one fair. for me. Yeah, I think so. I think. And by the way, I was literally just using it, and it worked. Wow. <laughs> what do you mean? Like you had a problem so and it fixed it? Everyone, you know, this doesn't happen a lot in Windows 7. I, I, in Windows Vista, there was this deal where you could run a program, and it would disable Arrow. And this used to happen fairly frequently. Right. And it, in Windows 7, that doesn't actually happen a lot. In fact, it, it's very rare, but... Literally, as you were doing your Audible bit, I started running this application, and it was the the Microsoft Fixit application disabled Arrow. What? And yeah, so by mistake, I mean if something happened, it, it crashed the graphics subsystem or something. Oh, so good. yeah, so you had to yeah. Reboot. So general, no. Usually, what happens is you uh, stop running the errant application. Oh, and it'll do it. Arrow will come back. But when oh, I, I did, had it, that happen. Uh, Auto, yeah. uh, Audition does that because it, uh, I don't know if it's for performance. Probably is. Or because yeah. it's old. It, it just will says, say the system's running in right. this, uh, Disabling this, basic. this. But as soon as you close the program, it comes back. Yeah, so it didn't come back. So I re-ran Fix-It, and then I ran the troubleshooter for Arrow, and, and it fixed it. So it fixed oh. its own problem. It's a typical Microsoft application. It right? caused the problem, but it fixed it. <laughs> but it fixed it. So it said the issue that it found was that the desktop window manager was disabled. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you can say, you know, did it fix the problem? Yes or no, mm -hmm. et cetera. Not anymore. It's fixed. Anyway, some nice automated troubleshooters here, and uh, again, just uh, one of those things you want to have in your in your tool boot, uh, tool belt. Tool boot. I have a tool, tool boot. boot. I do have a tool boot. You're a tool boot. I have a tool boot. You see, this is applicable to almost any situation. <laughs> so useful. Yeah. You're a tool boot. Uh, Paul, let's see. What are we going to do yes. here? We have. You said oh, you have another second, one. Second, you have another yeah. extra. So, extra. Thank, and thank you for blowing this away earlier, by the way. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm <laughs> it's just a, the, I'm a uh, bad man. The Microsoft Touchback for Windows 7. During the Windows 7 beta, Microsoft made this available to testers, and then they provided it to PC makers when Windows 7 was delivered so that if they had a, uh, a touch-based computer, they could ship one or more of these programs with their computers. But I and many others, you know, went back to Microsoft and said, why, why aren't you just giving this away? I mean, any, anyone would want to get some of this stuff. There's some games and, and some cool little programs. So starting today, uh, they're offering the touchback for Windows 7 for free to anyone who has Windows 7. So you can download now, this it, package. Of, uh, it wouldn't be any good if you didn't have a uh, touch screen, though, right? You, uh, you wouldn't use you know, it. You know, you can actually use it without a touch screen. Obviously, uh, when you see the applications, it's, it's much, much better with a touch screen. Right. Some of them were really cool. Um, These are like the surf. The applications were on Surface, right? Yeah, okay. exactly right. Like the pond. Right. I love can, that stuff. Yeah, it's really neat. There's a blackboard game, which is an awesome uh, puzzle type game with physics and whatnot. That's actually really uh, addictive. There's a Surface globe, uh, which is you literally spin the Earth with your finger and you zoom in and out and all that stuff. It's it's really really neat. So there's some cool stuff here. And the fact that most of these things are called Microsoft Surface something should be a, a <laughs> tip as to their uh, genealogy, but um, it's it's a, just a neat little pack. So if you have a, a multi-touch uh, laptop or computer, or whatever, and who doesn't these days? Who doesn't? Yeah, sure. Yeah, very very nice. Yes, yeah, grab it now from Microsoft. And we'll put uh, links to uh, all of those in our show notes so you can get that stuff. Um, I like yes, to fix it. I want to download uh, both of those. Yes, I don't even have a touch screen, and I want them. <laughs> 
You should check them out anyway. They're neat. I, I mean, think I will. Well, I remember seeing them on, uh, actually, it was like one of those HP. Um, yeah, the Touch, touch Smart. Smarts. And because uh, so it's, OEMs have been bundling them in some cases. So yes. This yep. is in case you do. The didn't thing is so it. weird, though, is, is some of them haven't. And I don't understand that. Why would you just give this thing away? Well, if you got a touch screen, for sure. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. what I mean. I, yeah, yeah. It's crazy not to just give it away. Crazy. I mean, it's free. Yep. Uh, Paul Therat is the uh, uh, news editor at uh, Windows IT Pro. He's also the author of Windows 7 Secrets. Dun, 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 dun. Dun. And Windows Phone Secrets soon to come. He's working on it right now. Yep. And uh, the best place, though, to find more Therat is at his blog, which is winsupersite.com, the super site for Windows. And Paul is here doing the show every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, 1800 UTC. So you can watch this live. You don't have to wait till we, you know, cut out the dirty words and the naked uh, girls. You can watch it happen. And the upshirts uh, the that ups, we... upshirt shots. We utilize every week. <laughs> Live.twit.tv. But if you happen to miss that, you can get the family-friendly version uh, at iTunes, at the Zoom Marketplace, and, of course, on YouTube, youtube.com slash twit in the Windows Weekly um, channel. Do you put these uh, on your uh, site now? I do. I oh, do. That's good. Well, I yeah, think we're getting pretty good sites. about getting these out fast now. I think we're down to... Yeah, so the issue I had on YouTube, I think, I don't know if I did this on air or not, but I was asking you folks, you know, I know we put them on YouTube, but it seems like they weren't getting up there very quickly. But actually... Um, the videos are on YouTube pretty quickly, but they're not promoted to that Twit channel necessarily uh. right away. So, uh, you know, if it's this coming Sunday, for example, if you go to YouTube slash Twit, the, the most recent episode listed will be last week's. But if you search for the, the you know, the, the episode number is what, 153, right? Yeah. So if you go to YouTube and search Windows Weekly episode 153, it will, it's there. Oh, okay. It just hasn't been promoted to the you know, to the front of the site. So I think now that, that maybe that we have to do that manually or something. No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't but, know if it's a YouTube thing or because it's there. It's nice because on my, on my own podcast page, I can, you know, have all the links to the, the tips and the picks and the feature of the week and all this stuff, but I can actually embed the video now. Um, Great. You know, for the episode. So yeah, it's nice. Paul, we thank you so much for being here every week. We, and I, I, it's one of my favorite shows, and I know it's our audience is. Uh, it is one of it. my favorite shows as well. <laughs> it's your own. <laughs> <laughs> until until uh, uh, Bruins talk comes back. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Paul and his brother. It's a great show if you haven't heard it. It's in, and not suitable for work. You're a so Bruin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, you're a Bruin. We'll yeah, see you next week. A little more profane than that. But. Is it? <laughs> we'll see you next week on Windows Weekly.